Welcome, dear friends, uh, to this ongoing series uh, on Purgatory, the Dogma Explored. I'm Father Clement Machado, and last time we discussed uh, Purgatory as it pertained and witnessed by those early champions of the faith, those great shepherds, the fathers of the church. Today I wish to continue in that same vein of producing those texts that give us the insight of this teaching on purgatory. To continue with St. Augustine, he states in his great tract, his great treatise, Handbook on Faith, Hope, and Charity, written towards 421 A.D. He states, The time which interposes between the death of a man and the final resurrection holds souls in hidden retreats, accordingly as each is deserving of rest or of hardship, in view of what it merited when it was living in the flesh. Nor can it be denied that the souls of the dead find relief through the piety of their friends and relatives who are still alive. When the sacrifice of the mediator, and in this case he's referring to the mass, is offered for them, meaning friends and relatives, or when alms are given in the church, it is viewed as a prayer done in faith, done through the motions of the Holy Spirit. He states in such a case, these things are of profit to those who, when they were alive, merited that they might afterward be able to be helped by these things. There is a certain manner of living, neither is so good that there is no need of these helps after death, nor yet so wicked that these helps are of no avail after death. Here he is talking about a Christian who has lived a relatively good life, yet not one of exceptional sanctity. Again, the early Christians of the first few centuries, including those of the time of Augustine, had a great admiration for the martyrs. They were the exceptional saints. Those were the people that rather you sought their intercession than they seeking yours. He talks about in this text merit. Oftentimes, there are separated brethren of other Christian denominations, non-Catholic churches, that state, once again, we're talking about works. We're talking about man's work, man trying to bring on salvation. Where is God? Where is faith? Obviously, St. Augustine is presupposing a man has faith in Jesus Christ, a man has an active, fertile faith, thereby receiving God's grace, God's help to merit. Nobody, strictly speaking, merits before God. We don't deserve anything. All is gift. The Latin word for grace is gratia, which means something free, something spontaneously given. A person merits eternal life, merits through their works, only because they are able to through God. God's grace is primary. He renders a work justifiable or not in his eyes. He can make a work that is very human supernatural. He can render a work such as giving a glass of water something that opens us up to rewards of eternal life. That is why Christ himself stated, if one gives a cup of water to one of these little ones in my name, they have an eternal reward. They have merited. All that is produced from start to finish through grace. Not on one's good works or presumptions. The merits are God's gift. When one does have these merits, eternal life is open to them. However, the early Christians, such as Augustine, did notice sometimes a person leaving this world has not brought closure to all of his past. There are still some attachments to sin or sinful inclinations. Somehow, a man or woman may leave 
this world, depart from this world with some of the brokenness of sin. Yes, they've been saved, yet there is some purification at work required. As we continue on, the fathers of the church, St. Ambrose states in his commentary on St. Paul on 1 Corinthians, he states that purgatory does exist, not using necessarily the word purgatory, but he states it, we pray for the soul of the departed emperor. Give, O Lord, rest to thy servant Theodosius, that rest thou hast prepared for thy saints. I loved him, therefore will I follow him to the land of the living. I will not leave him till by my prayers and lamentations he shall be admitted unto the holy mountain of the Lord, to which his deserts call him. Ambrose, in his funeral oration, making commentary on St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, also is including a prayer for Theodosius, the emperor. The early Christians just judging on Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul and St. Peter, they do mention intercession on behalf of civil leaders. Ambrose not only is pray prayed for Theodosius while he was alive on earth, he was his friend, but even afterwards he said, I will not rest with my prayers until I myself join with him in the banquet halls of heaven. We find in the patristic treatment on purgatory a great deal of mention of prayers, of suffrages. We just have to look once again at the ecclesiastical writer Origen, another important source of early Christian doctrine. He's very clear when he states if a man depart this life with lighter faults, lighter faults, not grave faults, he is condemned to fire which burns away the lighter materials and prepares the soul for the kingdom of God where nothing defiled may enter. For if on the foundation of Christ you have built not only gold and silver and precious stones, once again, citing 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but also wooden hay and stubble, what do you expect when the soul shall be separated from the body? Would you enter into heaven with your wood and remain without and receive no reward for your gold and silver and precious stones? Neither is this just. It remains then that you be committed to the fire which will burn the light materials. For our God to those who can comprehend heavenly things is called a cleansing fire, purgatio, from which we get the word purgatory. But this fire consumes not the creature, interesting, the creature is saved. But what the creature has himself built, wood and hay and stubble, it is manifest that the fire destroys the wood of our transgressions and then returns to us the reward of our great works. In other words, there are some materials that we may have carried throughout our life that is not built on the rock of the gospel, that is not heavenly sent, but a pure human invention in vanity. Those need to be purified. That's what he alludes to when he states wood and hay and stubble. We have St. Cyprian who said, according to the custom of the apostles, the custom of the church, we pray for those that maintain the communion with the rest of the Christian community, the Christian church, the Christian assembly. It was very common to forbid the customary prayers for those deceased who had clearly violated church ecclesiastical laws as well as basic gospel tenets or the essential commandments, such as the Ten Commandments. 
he states, Our predecessors prudently advised that no brother departing this life should nominate any churchman as his executor, and should he do it, that no oblation should be made for him, nor sacrifice offered for his repose. The early Christians, particularly those in the Eastern churches, such as St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil of the Great, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, stated there are souls who leave this world in the peace of God. They rest. However, they say we must pray that they have eternal repose, eternal rest. There seems to be something of ambiguity here. What do they mean by their resting, but it is not yet an eternal rest? There is some form of purification. There is some transitional stage between leaving this life and receiving the glorious rewards that have been heaped up for them in heaven. When we look at St. Basil's writing, particularly as concerns the Holy Spirit, what is known in Latin, the Spiritus Sanctu, his great treatise on the Holy Spirit, he states that there will be two judgments, two fires, one for those hardened in sin, impenitent, showing no signs of remorse upon leaving this world. Those particular individuals will face the judgment of damnation. He goes on to state there will be individuals, however, that are in God's grace, God's sanctity, in which the Holy Spirit indwells. However, they need to have sin or vice uprooted from them in a purifying fire, a purgatorial fire and experience. In the Apostolic Constitutions, we have a testimony of major Christian practices and customs that define the essence of the believing Christian. They state, the Oriental churches or the Eastern churches particularly refer to these documents, state, in the liturgy, we must pray for them and with them. We accompany them with our prayers, with our suffrages. In St. Basil's writings, oftentimes he alludes to this purifying experience. St. Gregory the Great himself had stated he experienced a vision in which he saw a brother that had left this world yet not purified, not reached the heavenly homeland, not reached home base, so to speak. He had stated he offered the Mass, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, for 30 consecutive days, upon which, at the end of which, the soul of that individual monk was released from the bonds of purification into the glories, the radiance of heaven itself. St. Gregory the Great is considered one of the later, one of the last of the Church Fathers, one of the last Western Church Fathers of the 6th century, 6th, 7th century. He was Pope, he was a man of reform, brilliant, full of keen insight, his reform was intended to maintain the integrity of the apostolic teaching, to be able to promote and advocate the essential Christian beliefs, translated in common practice, prayers, devotion, as well as translating it as faithfully as possible into the Mass, into the various sacramental liturgies of the Church. St. Isidore of Seville, which is now in present-day Spain, in the 8th century provided a great testimony as to the current practice of bishops, 
clergy and Christian laity of his day. He was clear, abundantly riverbating the practice of suffrages, offering up the mass for the deceased to the point where the deceased could be freed upon God's mercy as well as God's mercy being begged for, implored through the Christian community's prayers. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, in some cases, especially in the Western or Latin Church, has been given more or less an honorary title of Father of the Church, although he was of the 11th, 12th century he is still considered a very authorized and authentic, authoritative witness to the Christian faith and Christian practice of praying for the dead, for the deceased, to the point where, as the Middle Ages progressed, St. Bernard of Clairvaux was able to synthesize so well the practice of his day. At that time, purgatory had reached a theological articulation and definition unparalleled until his day. It was an age where we saw St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, St. Albert the Great, Alexander of Halles, and various other scholastic theologians. We call them scholastic because they were theologians that learnt and transmitted the faith via established schools or universities. And thereby they were called the schoolmen or scholastics. When we pursue this journey through the ages, over the course of centuries, we can see clearly, we can see in a very clear, transparent, crystalline light how the early Christians viewed purgatory. Though they did not use the actual word purgatory and it didn't seem to arrive on the scene except with St. Augustine and St. Jerome, the very reality was expressed in other terms, sometimes in phrases or purely indicative mode such as praying for the dead. In the early fathers of the church, whether Latin or Greek, we need to understand their notions of the faith, their transmissions of theology, the vocabulary used was based on scripture, based on the word of God revealed not only through the written word of the Bible, but through the apostolic example and preaching. This is where, as Catholics and even as Orthodox, we understand God's teachings, the gospel and its revelation, has not just been compressed and fully handed into one book. We are not simply people of the book, such as in the Muslim faith, where they say we are people of the book. Rather, we have to understand we are people who wrote the book. The Bible is a compendium of the Christian doctrine handed down. That is what's called traditio in Latin, from whence we get the word tradition, passed on, conveyed, and brought into a print form a catechesis, but in no way is it intended to be a thoroughly absolute and exhaustive teaching of every single truth that God has revealed us. There are truths that have been handed down just through example. For example, the Sunday worship, right from the time of the apostles, we recognize it is something of gospel origins or apostolic origins and thereby we pursue it as something that is normative, not merely accessory to our Christian faith, yet normative and a substantive portion or component of our faith. 
Purgatory is not just a question of language or semantics. The reality has been expressed in various terms through various languages. Through the genius of time, culture, and language, somehow God has inspired the church of a greater understanding and deepening of this reality. Theology only provides a vocabulary to this reality. God's revelation, God's mysteries transcend human thought. However, human thought can capture or seize upon some of the reality. Different words, definitions can be used, whether in the Greek, the Latin, the Hebrew, the Aramaic language. Friends, as we pursue this journey into purgatory, we realize the fathers of the church are authentic witnesses to not only the Bible, but to the apostles themselves. When we look at St. Hilaire of Poitiers, that great Latin bishop and father of the church, who in the fourth century in his commentaries on the Psalms, writings on the trinities, again made mention of this constant practice of praying on behalf of the dead. Once again, the privilege seemed to center around the sacrifice of the Mass, or the Eucharistic sacrifice. Eucharistin, in Greek, it means thanksgiving, giving thanks unto the Lord. St. Hilaire, St. Isidore, St. Gregory the Great, St. Gregory of Nyssa, Augustine, Lactantius, St. Jerome, St. Gregory in his dialogues, Origen, all these have played a major part of articulating, not creating, not inventing, not manufacturing new doctrine, however, putting it into words, defending it against non-Christians, against pagan currents of thought against those that wish to undermine the faith, heretics. St. Irenaeus, in his great teaching, an apologetic tract called Adversus Hereses, or Against the Heretics, once again states the authority of the church, the witness of the church, lends credence to scripture. It is the church that carries, supports, interprets scripture throughout time, throughout space, throughout history. Saint Irenaeus stated already in the early second century after Christ, the book in and of itself is merely a book with words. However, it is the living faith of Christians in Jesus Christ that make this book come alive, that give it meaning, give it purpose, give it definition. So he is imploring his detractors, his adversaries, adversaries and enemies to look at the practice of Christians, one of them namely being the Eucharistic sacrifice. Within the core of that Eucharistic sacrifice, Prayer for the deceased Christians. Dear friends, let us now pray as we end and conclude this third episode. Lord Jesus Christ, we offer to you those brave Christian souls, those brave men and women whose faith is known to you alone. Lord, we ask you to grant them eternal rest. We ask you to shine your eternal light upon them. May you receive them after being purified from sin and rehabilitated. May they come spotless and without wrinkle into the joys of your kingdom, for you live and reign as one God forever and ever. Amen. And now, until the next time, have a wonderful day. God bless you.